You're listening to TIP. On today's show, I chat with Tom Sosnoff to discuss the ins and outs of options trading, how it works, some strategies for beginners, and its expected returns and risks. Tom is a well known entrepreneur and options trader. He was the founder of Thinkorswim, which he sold to TD Ameritrade, and is now the founder of Tasty Trade and Tasty Works, which he just recently, since we recorded this episode, sold for a billion dollars. Back on episode 7, I talked with Kirk DePlessis about trading options for beginners, and I received a lot of positive feedback from you guys about it. Still to this day, I get asked about options a lot on social media, so I thought I'd bring on one of the biggest names in options trading to talk about it more. I hope you guys enjoy this conversation with Tom Sosnoff. You're listening to Millennial Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire the millennial generation. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Millennial Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I'm super excited to have Tom Sosnoff. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks, Robert. Happy to be here. You have a background as an entrepreneur and as an investor, which are two of the main topics that we cover here on the show. So I want to talk a bit about both of those throughout the episode today. But let's start from the beginning. Tell us a bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today. I'm not exactly sure how I got here, but I'm here. <laughs> You know, it's funny you mentioned entrepreneur and investor. I guess I'm a really good entrepreneur. I guess I'm a really lousy investor, but I've been in this business. I'm kind of a junkie. So I've been in this business now for since I graduated college in basically 1979, 1980. So it's been one industry for me for 40 years. Why would you say you're a lousy trader or investor? I'm a good trader. I've been trading for 40 years. So I'm a survivor. I'm definitely past that test. I said I'm a lousy investor. I'm not a good passive investor. I'm not a good judge of, I guess, investments. I, I don't think I can. I can't focus that well on that kind of stuff. So I have a soft spot in my heart because because uh, people, when I first got started, people gave me money to trade with and and bet on me. So I bet on a lot of people. You can't sit back and let you know let it passively grow. You have to be actively trading. Of course, hundred percent. Has there been anything in your entrepreneurial journey that has impacted how you trade options and just any other? Types of instruments that you trade? There's definitely, I'm definitely partial to, to very short term active instruments. Like, you know, I don't trade a lot of stocks. I trade mostly, you know, all options and, and futures and options on futures, really any kind of alternative you know, investment. I have a shorter term time frame. So I think that I guess if there's a financial instrument that I like, it's something that, you know, has a shorter lifetime. The majority of the audience that's listening today are young investors or are just relatively new investors. Some have a little bit of experience with options and have heard previous episodes that we've talked about it, and others are completely new. They've never heard of options. So before we get into a deep discussion about options trading, I want to define some key terms that I think are going to be important for everyone listening to understand so that they can really get the most value from today's episode. So could you define for us what options are, the different types, puts, calls, and how they all work? I'm a really bad options 101 teacher, and you'd think I'd be good at this because I do it all the time. Just think of, and, and the funny thing about the whole financial space is when I got into the business, the only reason I got into the world of finance, because I was really studying international government and politics and things like that when I was in school, I never studied finance. And the only reason I got into finance was because it was the middle of a recession and it was the only job interview I got, and they offered me a job. So I took it at a big investment banking firm. Drexel Burnham at the time. They're out of business now, but at the time, they were one of the biggest boutique firms in, in America. And so they offered me a job and I just took it and I've stayed in the business ever since. But I got involved in options right away because it, they just seemed kind of... I was like, what are these things? And they, they caught my attention. And, and here's the reason. So most financial instruments, and this goes to all of your listeners, most financial instruments are what we call static. They're very black and white. So for example, if you want to buy a piece of real estate, you know, you buy it and all you hope for is it goes higher. If you want to buy a stock, you can go long or short it, but you're hoping it either goes higher or lower. That's a static trade. It's purely black or white. If you buy or sell a commodity or a future like, you know, gold or Bitcoin or whatever it is, essentially you're hoping it goes higher if you buy it, you're hoping it goes lower if you sell it. But those are static. They're not strategic. 
the world of options is gray. It's not black. It's not white. It's totally gray. You can be wrong and make money, and you can be right and lose money. So it's a strategic marketplace that is very liquid, very efficient, and a lot more fun because there's a lot more stuff you can do. So if you think of yourself as a, as a strategist, or better yet, if you think of yourself as somebody that's really good with numbers, like you, know, you love math, or you love probabilities, or you love statistics, then you'll like a financial derivative product like options. And that's why I got into that space. And, and I didn't even understand all this when I first did. And the marketplace has come a long way to where we are today. That's why firms like firms that people listening might recognize, like Robinhood and places like that, 70% of their business is now options. 70% of their revenue, 80% of their revenue is options. It's not stocks. What are some of the important terms or concepts that somebody needs to know when it comes to options traders if they're completely new? If they're just entering, they're hearing this, they want to get invested, where are some of the things that they should study and learn first? So options have a price dependency on what we call implied volatility. Implied volatility is, is another word for expected range. So if something has an implied volatility of X, that means it has an expected range of X. It's just a math formula. It's just a Black-Scholes you know, mathematical model. So what options do is they price themselves off of fear and opportunity. That, that's the simplest way to understand options. You have to appreciate an option's sensitivity to volatility if you're going to be strategic about it. And I think what, what a lot of people don't realize about options is you know, they were designed to, to give you leverage. Risk a little, make a lot. But there's lots of ways to play options and futures and futures options and everything else where you can potentially risk a lot to make a little. And if you're thinking, if you're listening and going, why would I ever risk a lot to make a little as opposed to risk a little to make a lot? And the answer is because the probabilistic model is all symmetrical. I'm speaking a little bit like I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of a high level discussion, but the reason for it is anybody can give you a definition of you know, a put or a call or you know, a call spread or a put spread. But when you really want to understand strategic investing, if you limit your profitability, you increase your probability of success. And that's one of the things that we love about options is, and, and all derivatives is that you have an opportunity to be A, capital efficient, and B, to potentially limit your profitability for a higher probability of success or accept a lower probability of success for unlimited profitability. It's your call. And that's kind of one of the really cool things that you can't do with any other financial instrument. The next piece is in the world of stock trading right now, when you think about it, is you have a lot of millennial investors and you think about different stocks. Let's say some millennial investor says, you know what? I'm really interested in Tesla. Well, Tesla is a $740 stock. So 100 shares of Tesla, okay, is $74,000. Most millennial investors don't have $74,000 to buy 100 shares of stock with. So what are you going to buy? You're going to buy one share for $740? or a fractional share that you can't do anything about, that's not interesting to me. But for $200, you can sell a put spread and get long Tesla. Or for, for $100, you can buy a call spread, meaning that you know, if Tesla goes up, you profit. And you'll make more money than you would have made if you bought one share of stock. And so there's lots of ways to participate in a capital efficient world in a, in a time when there's very little capital efficiency in the financial markets because they're so expensive. Stocks have priced themselves out of the millennial price range. I mean, Amazon is a $3,200, $3,300 stock. You know, even when you kind of look down the list of the most active stocks, I mean, Tesla is $735 on the close today. You know, Netflix is $520. Google is $1,740. Facebook is $270. These, to buy 100 shares of Facebook is $27,000. That prices most small investors and most millennials out of the 100 share stock marketplace, which is a round lot, it limits all the different strategies you can use. The option marketplace opens it all back up to you. And that's what's cool about it. Yeah, the same could be said for two other companies that I really like, Mercado Libre and Shopify. They're both over $1,000 a share. There's nothing a millennial can do with those. There's nothing you can do in Shopify. You know, I mean, that's the problem. But if you have $200 to risk, you can do a five point wide iron condor and play that the stock will land in the middle. Or you can sell a put spread and hope the stock goes higher, or sell a five dollar wide call spread for for two hundred and fifty dollars and risk two hundred and fifty dollars, you know, and hope the stock goes goes down. And there's all these different things you can do 
as a strategist that are super cool that you can't do as a passive investor. When does somebody get started with these? If somebody's new to the markets, is it good for them to just jump right into options or should they have some experience with stocks first? One of the biggest misconceptions about finance is that you need this ridiculous level of experience or, or you would have played the markets for some time. Yeah, there's a little bit of terminology. I mean, if you can figure out how fantasy football works, you can figure out today's technology for trading. We own Tastyworks, which is our trading platform. It's high frequency based middleware. It's front end technology that blows away any gambling app or anything else that's ever been built for trading. You can learn that in two seconds. It's super simple. You can trade any product that's completely product and different. The reason I bring this up is because anybody that can figure out how to use an iPhone can figure out how to trade on one of these platforms in a few seconds. And that opens up virtually every strategy and every financial product with no restrictions instantaneously. And here's the beauty of it. Where else can you build up risk-taking skills and decision-making skills? Where's a better place than the financial markets, which are incredibly efficient? I mean, that's the coolest thing. How old are you? 25. 25. So at 25, you don't have a lot of opportunity, unless you're trading, to make financial decisions that have a monetary outcome that can be feel good or, or hurt you, and emotional decisions that lead to a monetary income or some kind of some kind of outcome where speed of decision making, all of those come into play. Where your brain processing speed is the motivation along with testing yourself strategy wise. You have no other opportunity. Nobody does. You can't trade anything else to do to make that happen. But in the world of trading, active universe, you can do all that. And you can do all of it with a few thousand dollars and you can change the outcome of everything else you do for the rest of your life. What strategies do new option traders start with? You mentioned four, five, six of them. They're maybe not the most complex, but a lot of people that are new to options probably haven't heard of them. So what type of strategy do they start with? I'll get that to one second. I'll just give you a little second of background. So you asked me earlier how I got started in this business. I told you it was the only job offer I got. And when I first started working for this financial firm and trading options, I had no idea what they were. And all I know is I made more trades in my first six months than any other person working at this firm. I didn't make any money. I didn't lose any money. I just broke even after six months, but I made like 650 trades. So they called me into some, some manager. Well, I was 23 years old. Some manager called me in and said, hey, you've made more trades than every other employee at this firm combined. What is going on with you? And I'm like, I don't know. I just really like it. It's kind of fun. And I didn't make any money, but I learned so much from doing that. I learned a hundred times what I learned working at this firm, which I learned nothing. I learned so much from making those trades that it changed the trajectory of my whole life. And that's how you become an entrepreneur, or that's how you become whatever it is that you, know, you decide to ultimately do. So I argue that that's the beauty of, of active trading and being aggressive in the marketplace. But what strategies does somebody do for the first time? Well, if you're bullish, you, know, you can sell an out-of-the-money put. One lot. If you're, if you're bullish, you can sell an out-of-the-money call spread. If you're bullish, you can, meaning if you think a stock's going to go higher, you can buy stock and sell a call, do a covered call on an inexpensive stock. But selling a put's a little more capital efficient. If you're bearish, you, know, you can sell a call spread, you can sell a call, or you can you know, buy a put spread. There's, there's all these things that are very inexpensive to do. And a few hundred dollars, $50, $100, $200, $200 something like that. And they, they teach you everything about strategy, about decision-making, about risk assessment. Once you short something, the way you look at the markets is forever changed. If you only buy stuff, you have no perspective on what a two-sided market is. If you sell stuff as well as buy stuff, you can think about things much more objectively and much more subjectively. Why did they call you in your office, in their office? Why did they care how many trades you had? I'm curious. Because they wanted to make sure I was wor- they were paying me to work. And they wanted to say, hey, you know what? There's something wrong with you. But back then, people didn't make that many trades. I went from that job straight to the trading floor on the SIBO. And I quit there after six months and went, moved to Chicago and went on the floor of the SIBO to trade. And I promise you, I'd never been east of the East River, never been west of the East River before. So you're on the East Coast. I grew up in, outside of New York and I'd never been west. I just went to Chicago and started trading and st- stayed there for the next 40 years. I want to talk about selling naked puts because it's a strategy that I use. I wouldn't necessarily classify myself as an options trader. I do make trades from time to time. Typically, it's like 
one or two times a month. I'm not trading every day or even every few days. But one of my strategies or one of my favorite strategies is just selling naked puts and pretty conservatively. I look at 100-day historical volatility and use three standard deviations typically to calculate the probability that a stock will trade within the given price and then allowing that stock option to expire worthless so that the buyer expires worthless for the buyer and I keep the premium as the seller. I typically only make this trade if the stock has a likelihood of staying above that price of 70-75%. And that, of course, limits my returns and the premium I can collect. But for me, I like this conservative approach. What do you think I might be missing about this strategy? And why might it be a bad strategy? First of all, it's not a bad strategy at all. It's what we call a high probability strategy. And it's not a bad strategy. In fact, if you go back through the history of the stock market, it is the most effective, most capital efficient, most effective, highest probability strategy there is. There's a saying in this business that puts a schmutz. And essentially, what you're doing is, is probably assuming that you're bullish, what you're doing has the highest probability of success. We trade the exact same way. We have probably a tighter set of mechanics than you. Like we'll go to a specific delta because we know that the options are all priced off volatility anyway. So we'll go to a specific delta. We usually go about 45 days out. Our optimal sweet spot, and for a lot of reasons, it has to, we're out of the money options fall on decay curve. The sweet spot is about 45 days out. The sweet spot is about around the 20 delta strike, which means there's an 80% chance they don't get to that number. And the ideally, you don't want to hold those to expiration. Ideally, you want to cover. In about 21 days, and that's it, left till expiration. So you sell it at 45 days, cover it 21 days, sell into high implied volatility, and that is your highest probability trade. So you're not doing anything wrong at all. You're doing it right. What I like about it is that it's not, you're not really risking the farm, if you will. I see a lot of millennials that are trading these super lottery type pick options, and that just to me isn't like a sound or viable strategy. To me, this is like a pretty high cash flow conservative strategy. Well, the difference is that it worked very effectively buying a lot of cheap options in a stock like Tesla or buying a lot of cheap options in a stock like Zoom last year. And there was a bunch of other EV stocks and things like that. People got paid and they got lucky. They, they hit, it's almost like last year was a little bit of one of those lotto years. And so you get romanced. It's sexy to get paid 10 times on what your risk is. You're thinking to yourself, I have a story I tell. It's my first option trade ever. I was 23 years old and I bought a two lot of puts in a stock called McDermott, which is no longer, it was an oil service stock, which is no longer in existence. This is, I remember, I've made millions of trades. I remember them almost all, scary. But I bought a two lot of puts in McDermott and I paid $300 for each one, $3 a piece. And a couple of days later, the stock dropped and I sold them at 420. So after commissions and everything else, I made about $200 on my two lot. Bought them at three, sold them at four, made 200 bucks after commissions. I lived with nine guys. We had a giant house and we were just out of college. And I went back into the house and I told all my buddies, I'm like, I freaking got this. I found something none of you guys have ever even heard of before. We're going to make a fortune. We didn't, none of us had any money. So we're, these were all, we were all in our first job. So I got everybody to pull together all their money. We pulled couple thousand bucks together and I took it and I started trading options. In two weeks, I lost every penny. Nobody talked to me for a month. <laughs> These are my best friends since, since we were five years old. I was like, I couldn't believe what an idiot I was. And I thought at the time, like I had discovered, I really thought I found God type of thing. And I realized two weeks later, I was beyond clueless. And that's what motivated me to you know, learn the space. There is no free money. And all there is is math equation that works. We play a game called law of large numbers. That's all it is. And if you do things with a high probabilistic outcome, eventually, if you do it enough times, it's going to work. That's the simplest way I can explain how I've learned to adapt to this business over the last 20 years. What was the strategy that you implemented that lost it all? What was, what was the mistake you made? Oh, back then, I have no idea. Probably just bought options. I have no idea. I mean, I didn't have enough money to do anything but buy options. But my trading has changed. I'm still a junkie. I mean, I trade 75 to 125 times a day. And I'm a retail customer, just like you or anybody else. So, I mean, you know, I trade 15, probably close to 15,000 trades a year right now as a retail customer and as the CEO of our company. So, so I have a full-time job too. And I trade everything, futures, 
options on futures, stocks, stock options, indexes, ETFs. I don't care what it is. I'm product indifferent. When we talked about the naked puts, you mentioned that you don't typically hold till expiration. Is that because data and research has shown that it's not the optimal strategy? That's correct. The fastest point in the decay curve for out-of-the-money options is between day 45 and day 21. That is when you make the most money with, with the least amount of what we call, we call it the standard deviation, but it's really the least amount of risk. It's the variability of, of the standard deviation. It's risk. So you have the, the most potential with the least risk from 45 days to 21 days. Inside of 21 days, what happens is there's what we call gamma risk. That's basically another word for saying, how fast can this position bite you in the ass? And that's called gamma risk. And, and that's when the gamma risk kicks in in like the last two weeks of every expiration cycle. So you take the least amount of risk in a longer period of time and the most risk in the shorter period of time. And that's how options basically break down. So yeah, the answer to your question is yes. Is it also a proponent of taking money off the table? Because if, if you've made a trade and you've made, I don't know, say you've collected 80% of the premium in the first, would you say, 45 to 21, so 24 days, then you, maybe you could catch another 20% of the premium, but maybe you've already collected 80%. You just take that off the table before you lose that? You are correct. And it's not 80%. If you can get to a 50% number, then you take it. So the answer is like, you like to sell puts. Let's say you sell a put for a dollar. If you can get to 50% or 50 cents, in the first 24 days, you take it. That's mathematically optimal. We own Tasty Trade, which is the largest digital network now in the world for finance. And then Tasty Trade owns Tasty Works and a couple of other companies too. We own a digital, you know, digital asset company. We own a magazine. We own, um, we own another brokerage firm called Doe that competes with the free ones. We have an advisory. We have lots of different companies. But our primary business or my primary job is to provide financial content. And in that, we have it's all free. And our archives have literally thousands or tens of thousands of hours of mathematical concepts. We don't do any fundamental or technical analysis. We are anti fundamental, anti technical analysis. All we do is math and quantitative analysis. Is this research statistically significant? And does it meet the math test? And if that is the case, then we put it out there. We're a think tank. That's something that I'm going to have to take from this episode and implement in my portfolio because for the most part, I've let them just go to expiration. And typically, it hasn't really bitten me yet. There was one time where it did. I think I had already gotten maybe 90 to 95% of the premium, but I was waiting for that last 10, 5, 5 to 10%. And then it went against me and I ended up having to buy the underlying shares. But this is going to be, I think this is going to be a good implementation for my strategy. We have great research on this, Robert. It's awesome. And, and you can see all the numbers. We'll play it out for you. It's amazing. You take, just to give you a ballpark, you take almost 300% more risk in those last three weeks than you take in the first three and a half weeks. And so when you sell, you just buy the next one that's 45 days out. What if you're doing it at 30 days? Do you not recommend buying at 30 days? That's fine because you can't always do 45 days. You just do closest to. Still, it stays at the 21 days? Absolutely. The technology today is so good and it's so cheap. Trading is basically free. I mean, it's just a hair over free. You can't afford free. Like, if you're trading, anybody listening to you, you're trading on a free app, it's a mistake because they're not good enough. You need better technology. Like, you need really intelligent technology. You know, like we say, you can't afford free. You need something that's beautifully designed, intelligent technology that, that can apply strategic logic to it. In those examples, man, it's so good. You can, you can roll stuff forward. You can do it all as a single click. You, know, you can take your front month position, roll to another back month. You can buy in your front month. You can diagonalize it and go to the back month. You can do anything you want nowadays. You can change your quantities. You can do it all as a single click. Piece of cake. Other than Tasty Trade, which I would recommend people go to, other than that one, what are some other platforms that do well? The best platform in the industry for the last decade or so has been a platform called Thinkorswim. I built that. And our team at Tasty built Thinkorswim. We started, we were floor traders. We left the floor in 1999 and 2000. We built Thinkorswim from scratch and we became a public company. We were bought out in 2009 by TD Ameritrade and we left in 2011 to start Tasty Trade. And then in 2017, we launched Tasty Works with the same team that basically built, they built Thinkorswim back in 2000. So we built a bigger, we built a better mousetrap is what essentially what it is. So now we have the fastest growing 
brokerage platform in America next to, you know, behind Robinhood. Um, but we're a very different type of platform. It's not, you know, we're an intense piece of software. When it comes to we talked about selling on the upside of puts if it's going if it's going the way that you want it to, but what if it goes against you? Does research show that there's a point where you should say, this trade has gone against me, it's not coming back, I should just cut my losses? When you sell something, let's say we'll go back to your example originally. Let's say you sell a put and you sell with an 80% probability of success. So that means you're selling a 20 delta put. Our research suggests that if that put goes to, let's say, 40 deltas, it doubles in delta. So, so you have a losing trade on right now, that at that point, you should do something. So there's a couple of choices of what you can do. The first thing you can do is because you're short a put, you can sell a call against it for no additional capital. You're already short a put. So you can turn around and sell an out-of-the-money call. Let's say you're short a 40 delta put in the example you just, I took your example of selling, originally selling a 20 delta put, it becomes a 40 delta put. Now you're down money. So what can you do? For no additional capital, you could sell a 20 delta call and reduce the risk in your position theoretically by half. That's one thing. Or you can buy back your 40 delta put and move it out a month. So in other words, let's say right now you're trading January. You can move it out to February and then you can move your 40 delta to 30 delta for a small credit. That's your second choice. Third choice would be to reduce your size. And then the fourth choice, obviously, is you can cover the position or buy another option against it. But that would be our last choice. Is there one of those three things that's most optimal? Optimal is selling the call. And how does that work tactically? Could you give us an example? It could be a fake stock, but give us some numbers of a, a stock. So take a stock like XYZ, and let's say you sold a put for $1, okay? Just like you said. Now, all of a sudden, the stock started to go down. So you're wrong. And the put that you sold for a dollar is $2. So now you're short a $2 put. And now you're nervous because the velocity of risk is always to the downside in stocks. So now you're saying, well, I got to do something here. It's totally reasonable. So you look at the calls and you go, well, I'm going to sell a $1 call. That $1 call is going to offset half the risk of that $2 put, at least theoretically. You put up no additional capital to do that. That is the first thing you do. The second thing you do is if you, if you don't want to sell the call, because that makes you nervous about getting whipsawed or something, you, take, you buy back that, that $2 put in the front month and you sell a $2 or $2.50 put the next month out, but that'll be a lower strike put. So you're actually reducing your risk because you're giving, giving the trade more time. That's how options work. You pay for time. And that would be the second thing. And then the third thing is you can either buy a further, another put further out of the money or reduce the size of your position or close it altogether. How do you go about calculating your returns on this selling a naked put strategy? Do you divide the premium that you've received by the amount of money that you had at risk? Or do you just look at how much premium you collect throughout the year? And If you're asking how do we figure out return on capital, we don't look at trades on a return on capital basis because we think it's really misleading. In other words, you can create, you can kind of cherry pick return on capital without getting into too much of like, you know, too granular on this. You can make return on capital look whatever you want it to look like. But if you were doing it in the purest sense, you'd say, oh, I sold this put for a dollar and I put up $500 to do it. So my return on capital for one month is 20%. I mean, that's the sim most simplistic way to do it. And that's fair. So that's exactly how I've typically gone about it. But then I was thinking the other day as I was preparing to chat with you, and I'm like, if the trade's successful, we get all that money back, say we get that $500 back. Now our cost basis is essentially zero, right? And we made return without any money at risk. So now what is our return? It's, it's infinite, right? Yeah. It's basically basis reduction is what you're talking about. The original concept behind options, when, when, when retail customers got into option trading originally, it was really all about improving your basis. So for example, you buy a stock and then you sell a call against it that's out of the money. And then essentially what you're doing is you're, instead of buying the stock at $100, you're buying the stock at $98 if the call expires worthless. It's all about improving basis. If you want to get short a stock, you sell an out of the money put against it and you improve the amount. You know, you're, instead of selling it for 100, you're selling it for 102. So effectively what you're doing is you're improving basis. The whole business of options was about improving basis for one person. One set of people, it was about speculative leverage. The other set of people, it was about improving basis. Those opportunities and risks still stand true today, except today the markets are much more strategic. So there's even more things you can do, which didn't exist in prior decades. We've talked a lot about 
the benefits and the upsides of options, but what are some of the risks and downfalls that options provide? A lot of people trade too big. So one of the things with options, we have a philosophy at the firm, which is trade small, trade often, because trade small keeps your risk in check and often gives you law of large numbers. The mistake that virtually everyone makes that gets them in trouble is size. There is no issue in the whole world of finance other than size. Because if you believe like we believe, I don't know what you believe, but if you believe like I believe that markets are random, ultimately markets are random, that nobody knows what's going to happen next. And I've been around the block enough times to know nobody knows what's going to happen next. And given that, you know, the only thing that can get you in trouble and the only way that you can manage risk is based on the size of your positions. Ultimately, you can do certain things that are very mechanical, like you can sell the right delta, you can sell the right number of days, you can buy the right delta, you can buy the right number of days, you can do all the things. When you get in your car somewhere and you're going somewhere, you can't control what other people are going to do, but you can control your own risk. You know, you can, you can wear your seatbelt, you can not drink, you know, you can not be on the phone, you can go the speed limit. Those are the things you can control. In trading, it's exactly the same way and options even more so. Take care of the things you can control opening the trade at where you want to do it, using the right strategy, being diversified among strategy and underlyings, having the right number of mechanical days, having the right price objective, choosing the right delta, all that kind of stuff. You can't control what the stock's ultimately going to do. So just have the right size on. Stay small. For anyone who has studied Warren Buffett, they likely know that he's actually quite an options trader or just an options investor, if you will. For those who haven't studied him, they probably wouldn't know that because it's not really publicized. Why don't you think Warren Buffett's option strategies is widely covered in the financial news? I think it has been, you know, Warren Buffett's been a little on both sides of the fence on this. I mean, one of the famous Warren Buffett quotes are, you know, derivatives are basically weapons of mass destruction. You know, that's one of his famous mass financial destruction. The other side to it, you know, he's probably made billions of dollars, you know, selling option premium. When you're long a lot of stock, you can sell a lot of premium. Or when you want to get long a lot of stock, it's mathematically the most strategically viable way to get long theoretical stock. People that don't understand options and derivatives don't understand that they're the exact same thing as buying or selling stock. The theoretical equivalent is perfect. You can buy 100 shares of stock or sell two. Let's just make it simple. You can buy 100 shares of stock or you can buy two 50 Delta calls theoretically, it's the exact same thing at the exact same time. There's no difference. You can buy 500 shares of stock in the Spiders, for example, the S&P 500 ETF, which is the most actively traded product. You can buy 500 shares of Spiders. You can buy one S&P E-mini future, or you can do 10 at the money Spider options. And they're all the exact same thing. And people think, oh my God, that's so much different. They're not. They're all the same thing. Theoretically speaking, they're exactly the same at that moment. No difference. What would lead somebody to one strategy over the other? Either a lack of know-how or capital efficiency. And so is Buffett selling out-of-the-money calls essentially on stock that he owns a lot of, basically? So if he owns, say, 100 shares, but say he owns more than say a million shares, would he sell an out-of-the-money call? And if the stock goes up to that price, he has to sell? Generally speaking, I don't I think given the size and the scale that that he has of his underlyings I don't think he sells a lot of calls against his position. I think Warren Buffett from what I've read over the years he's much more of a put seller and an index put seller so like he'll sell let's say a billion dollars worth of S&P puts after a huge down move that kind of thing and then hope they expire worthless you know a year from now. I don't think he's a very sophisticated option trader. I don't think he has to be when you have Fifty or hundred billion dollars. I don't think you know we're going to judge him on his skill level of if he understands gamma risk or or you know whatever else it is. But I think he's been ridiculously successful because something that that he doesn't have to deal with that you have to deal with is the emotion of potentially pain. Whereas a small investor has to worry about you know their portfolio size and their net liquidating value. And somebody like him, you know, you can take a, a billion dollar shot and you're going to be fine. What do you think about those out, like long dated say put strategies? Say we want we were talking about selling puts earlier. We we're talking about selling them at forty five days. What if we sell them a year out, two years out, three years out? 
it's not an interesting strategy to me because it's, it's not something that's necessarily, I mean, there had been different points in history after huge down moves and volatility explosions where I think it's interesting maybe to consider it. But generally speaking, long-term options for me are, are just not, you know, it's like trading a stock. It's not that interesting. Is it just because it's not active enough? That's right. And you're limited to what you can do with it and you're stuck in that position forever. You know, one of the things I love about what I do is every month I get a clean slate. Every year I get to start over. Every month I get a clean slate. It's really cool. I like the fact that, that I get to essentially start over all the time. When I think about these long dated put strategies, I have a hard time imagining that, say, I don't know, just say a company Visa, right? Say we sell it $50 under where the strike price is $50 under where the share is today. I have a hard time believing that Visa is not going to be higher than that price in two years. I just find, even if we have a recession, I have a hard time that you know markets typically go up and to the right. So I find it hard to think that just macro thinking, not we're not getting into the nitty gritty of options. You're a millennial. You are right in smack dead center. My son's just a year or two older than you. He thinks the exact same way. You guys could be twins. Earlier this year in March, you got your first whiff of a bear market, but it didn't last very long. And you have never seen anything that is prolonged for longer than... I mean, you saw this March when the pandemic news broke, you saw a 35-day bear market of 30%. Imagine that market went down. So let's say you did Visa at $250. If the stock's trading $250, I don't know where Visa... Let me just see where Visa's trading. I don't trade it that often. $214, I think-ish. Yeah, $214. So let's say you sold the 150 puts. Let's say I went out to January of next year, 300 in January of 22, 381 days away. And I went down and sold the 150 puts. They're $5.50. So they're pretty, they're pretty far out of the money. They have a delta of 12. That means statistically, there's about a 10 or eight, there's an eight to 10% chance that it gets under 150. This is right in your wheelhouse. You collect five bucks for making that trade. Now, remember that even though there's only a 12% or a 10% chance of getting down to that 150 level, if we went into a prolonged bear market over the next, let's say, year or so, the idea that Visa couldn't go to $50, I mean, it easily could. And the amount of capital that trade is going to tie up, it could easily go under 100. And, and for that stock to be cut in half, you remember in the financial crisis of 2008, now you were only 13, but in the financial crisis of 2008, stocks like Visa went down to single digits. Single digits. So we're not talking about like $100. We're talking about like under 10. And I don't remember exactly how low Visa got during that whole move, whatever it was. But we're talking most of the stocks got under $20 or $25 and all the financial stocks got under 10. And Visa is a financial stock. So I'm just guessing it was under 10 bucks. So when you look at that, and the stock was probably 150 at the time, you're not thinking it's going to lose 90% of its value, but it could happen. And again, I understand that. I understand how positive drift works. And I understand you know, kind of how markets work over time, but it's not a guarantee. So is that a strategy that's better used if we had already seen a sell-off than you implement it then? I think so. If you've already seen a sell-off, then look at Visa for a second. I mean, yeah, it's a strategy that... Where do you think Visa got to in March? Just, as a, just in March. I bought a lot of Visa in March. So I think my cost basis, I think, was around like 140-ish. You bought almost the low, like 135 was the low in March. And we barely went down. We only went down 30%. If this market had sold off 50%, that stock would have been about 80 or 90 bucks. And if you had sold the 150 puts, you would have been nervous as hell. But the fact, you know, the only way to protect yourself and something like that, like if you wanted to go out and sell a put in Visa two years from now, I would sell it into a down move when it's scariest time. And I would also say super small. I would not do it at all time highs. Visa's two ticks off all time highs. And when you say small, one, two contracts? Well, it depends on the size of your account. For a millennial, one, two contracts, right? And if you're Warren Buffett, 10,000, 20,000 contracts, whatever it is. When we think about selling calls on the upside, a lot of people argue that that's not necessarily a great strategy because of this drift that you mentioned. Stocks typically go up and you're limiting your upside. What do you think about that strategy? I think it's absolutely fine. And especially 12 years into a bull market, I think it's better than fine. I mean, the hard part about selling calls is it has, over the last two decades, it's been less effective than selling puts. But I think over the next two decades, it's actually going to be a more effective strategy. 
because I don't think I don't think you're going to see the same upside velocity that you saw for the last 12 years. So I like the idea of selling calls for the next decade. As we round off the show, what's the best piece of advice that you can give to the listeners of the show? It could be about options trading, entrepreneurship, investing, or maybe even just life in general. What advice has really impacted you throughout your career? It's pretty simple, I think. For me, I mean, I can't, I, I shouldn't speak for anybody else. I tell this to my own kids and I, I tell this to everybody that I talk. I talk to lots of students, millennials, and you know, whether they're employees or anybody, friends, doesn't matter. It's really weird, but one day you're 25, like you are today, and you're going to close your eyes. And the next thing you know, you're 50. And you're going to wake up and you're going to go, where the F did my life go? And you're literally going to wake up and you're 50. Like, I still think I'm 25 and I'm 63. You do close your eyes one day and you wake up and it's 25 years later. So, my advice to everybody listening is every opportunity in your life that you have to take measurable or calculated risk, go for it. Don't ever hold back, not even once. Like, don't sit back and think about it. And I'm not talking about like, you know, doubling down on 11 when you're in Vegas with everything you have. Not that kind of, that's not the life advice I'm talking about. But every chance you have to do something where it's kind of a risky decision, but if it works out, the payout's going to be greater than the risk, you should take it. We call that kind of pot odds. And every opportunity you have to take risk, every decision that you get to make, like people say to us all the time, well, we built $2 billion companies in the last 20 years. That's pretty cool. And every opportunity we've had to take risk over the last 40 years, we've done it. Every single one. And I would say that the, the reason we've been successful is because we are not afraid to make a decision and take risk. And that's even at, at this age. At 22 or 23 or 25 or 27 or 30, take every bit of risk you can because otherwise you'll regret it forever. That's really timely advice and actually good confirmation for me. And I'll tell you a quick story because I raced motocross growing up. That was kind of my background. And then I stopped when I was 14. I didn't race for 10 years. And then when I was 24, I got back on a bike again. I was mostly just doing it for fun. And before I was on track to go pro, I, I had some big contracts when I was 14. And a couple of things happened. I didn't end up going pro. But so when I got back into it when I was 24, I decided I wanted to just do it for fun. It's like my biggest passion in the world. And then I started to think there's this race in Tennessee. It's the largest amateur motocross national in the world. And there's a big qualifying, a bunch of qualifying events that you have to do to get to it. And I said to myself, I said, if I don't try to make it to qualify for that event, I'm going to regret it. I said, I'm going to wake up, like you said, when I'm 50 and I'm going to regret this. So I went out, I bought a dirt bike, I started training again. And this summer I'm, I'm going for it. You know, It's one of my biggest things. And it's just so timely to what you just said. Yeah, I'm telling you, and, and, and this goes with life and business, personal stuff, just everything. And I'm not talking about taking stupid risk either. I'm just talking about like if it's, if it's calculated, whatever it is, and even if you, you know, assuming, I mean, hopefully you qualify, you win, whatever it is, but even if you don't, you're not going to regret it. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to make you think differently about every other decision you get to make. And it's going to, there's a lot of schools of thought about things like, the power of decision making and the power of taking risk. And for people that make a lot of decisions and take a lot of risk, their chances of being successful are almost a thousand times greater than people that don't. And, and you have to just, you have to respect that that is a very, when we hire people to work for us, we want people that can make decisions. That's the most important thing to us. Can you make a decision? Answer a question fast. I don't care if you're wrong, just make the decision. Tom, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a true honor and it's an interview that I've looked forward to for quite a while now. Where can everyone listening go to learn more about you and all the different things you're working on? If you want to watch me, if you, want, if you can take any more of me, every day from seven in the morning until 10 in the morning, we do a show on tastytrade.com. It's free and it's, uh, it's called Tasty Trade Live, seven to 10 in the morning, central time. Eastern time, it's, it's eight to 11, obviously. And then we're back on again in the afternoon for what we call last call from 2.30 to 3 central time. And then if you want to check out our, our brokerage firm, it's called Tastyworks. And you can check that out at tastyworks.com. It's the coolest piece of technology out there for trading. It's an amazing platform. And we also own another app called Doe, which is another brokerage firm, doe.com, D-O-U-G-H. 
We have a magazine called Luckbox, which is a fun magazine to read and it's free. You can go to Get Luckbox and it's a digital magazine and it talks about trading and life and everything else. This month's issue is on, it's on the art and science of forecasting. And I think that's a good start. We have a great learn center on tastytrade.com. And listen, if you want the coolest technology around and you want to see all the stuff that we do, and you want to do some of the stuff that we talked about today, just check out our stuff. I'll put a link to all those different resources in the show notes below so everybody listening can go check it out. I highly recommend that you do. Tom, thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. All right, guys. That's all I had for this week's episode of Millennial Investing. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. Make sure to subscribe to We Study Billionaires by the Investors Podcast Network. Every Wednesday, we teach you about Bitcoin, and every Saturday, we study billionaires and the financial markets. To access our show notes, transcripts, or courses, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decision, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.